1846, and Pluto, which they correctly show in their diagram, was not even discovered until 1930. So see, we're not the apex of knowledge. We are just now regaining knowledge that was here centuries ago. Slide. We have the example of the Baghdad battery. They found this years ago, it's just a little ceramic jar with a little uh, copper tube that went in another little copper thing, and they couldn't figure out really what this was until somebody thought to put some grape juice in there, put the tube in, and put the little copper point in there, and what happens? Lo and behold, you get a half volt of electricity. So they knew how to generate electricity, and they didn't have a huge power plant, they just do it with a jar and some grape juice. They knew the manipulation of energy at the atomic and subatomic level. Slide. And how do we know they knew all this stuff? Because of the Sumerian clay tablets that are still in existence. There are over half a million of them. 500,000 of these tablets are known to exist right now, and only about 20% of them have been translated. Isn't that amazing? Some of you young people here, if you want to know what to do with your life, learn to translate Sumerian. Okay? It was the world's first writing, and what they did was they used a stylus and they would press it into mud uh, with these little uh, triangular shaped styluses, and, uh, and then they'd bake it. It's a rock. That's why they still exist. Paper, papyrus, that all burns up, just, you know, flakes away, but these things still exist. These writings predate the Bible by 4,000 years, and they tell of human origin. Slide. Not once, but several times, according to Sumerian tablets, they say 432,000 years before the Great Flood, the Anunnaki came from Nibiru through the Great Bracelet, which is the asteroid belt, to the Earth. And here they landed in the Persian Gulf and began to colonize and search for gold. There were strikes over the hard work, and it was decided to engineer a slave race by manipulating the DNA of primitives. Kings and dynasties arose once this slave race came into existence, and warfare broke out, and that's a thumbnail sketch of what they say our history is. And it does answer one big mystery. For centuries, they've been looking for the missing link. We know Neanderthal existed, and then there was Cro-Magnon, modern man, and they've been looking for the link in between. For years, they thought that there should be something in there because they must have mated and interbred, but now we know for certain that they did not interbreed because they are two separate species. And there is no missing link because they manipulated the DNA. Slide. Gilgamesh, the legendary Sumerian king, the world's first epic novel, thought to be mythical, and yet now they have now found what they believe is the tomb of Gilgamesh. The story is amazing. You really ought to read the story of uh, Gilgamesh. He, along with his non-human companion, Enkidu, and we don't know what, who, or what Enkidu was, perhaps a robot, perhaps an organic robot, perhaps an alien, who knows? But it, they made it very clear that he was not a human. And they go in search, trying to find the ancient gods, looking for the secret of immortality, longevity, the secret of the white powder of gold. Slide. Recently, among the f amazing new discoveries that these French and archaeological, uh, French and German archaeological teams were finding in Iraq beginning in 1999, 2000, 2001, was using ground penetrating radar. They really believe that they may have found the tomb of Gilgamesh under the Euphrates River. Slide. But anyway, they were finding all of these amazing new discoveries. Did they find the secret of the monatomic gold? Did they find the secret of longevity, of free energy, of time travel, star portals? If you can manipulate energy and you can go to another, the, another dimension, you could probably create a wormhole. You could probably go to another star system and there we don't have to worry about the problem of spending hundreds of years blasting along in a, in a fueled, propelled rocket, you know, that it would take you to get to another star system. You jump through a wormhole and you're there. Or you jump through another dimension. But that brings us to Baghdad in April of 2003. Where would they have taken all these amazing new discoveries? They would have taken them to the Iraqi National Museum in Baghdad. And would they have immediately put them on display? No. 
They would have been put in the basement where they would have been cataloged and cleaned up and prepared for exhibit. But in spring of 2003, George Bush, against everyone's wishes in the world, invades Iraq. I went through this earlier, but the weapons inspectors, both ours and the United Nations, said there's no weapons of mass destruction. The Atomic Energy uh, Agency of the United Nations said there's no weapons of mass destruction. Even Saddam Hussein, the last minute, was finally going, okay, okay, whatever, send in the weapons inspectors, do what you want. Bush would not take yes for an answer. Okay, we were going to invade, and we did. And what we do? Against all military logic and tactics, instead of going for an objective, seizing your objective, solidifying your wins, and then moving on to the next objective, we made a beeline for Baghdad. This is what has created the problem in Iraq for the United States today because we failed to pacify the countryside. And what happened in Baghdad? Well, they put a Marine Guard on the Ministry of Oil, but there was no guard on the Iraqi National Museum, although several museum officials from around the world had already secured the promises from the Pentagon that they would protect the priceless treasures in the Iraqi National Museum, but it didn't happen. Slide. This, by the way, is... Uh, uh, the English version, and on the back is the Arabic version of some uh, uh, fly uh, flyers that the, that the military occupation forces were handing out. The coalition will destroy any viable military targets. The coalition does not wish to destroy your landmarks. We do not wish to harm the noble people of Iraq. To ensure your safety, avoid areas occupied by military personnel. So, you know, we went in there and said, you know, everybody clear out because we don't want to destroy you. And yet, even to this day, uh, we are continuing to bomb and to destroy some of the most sacred and ancient places in Iraq. Slide. And this is what the Iraqi National Museum looked like after the looting. Everyone concerned said the looting was a, done by an organized band. Now, there were probably and undoubtedly some, just some street people, some thugs that were hired to go in to give it the appearance of a looting mob. They went in, they sacked a lot of the upper floors, broke into exhibits, this, that, and the other thing. Slide. 170,000 items were looted. Slide. Ancient things dating back God knows how long. Gone. Slide. Safes opened up. Vaults opened up. Slide. Slide. But, of course, we did guard the oil ministry. <laughs> Slide. Now, oops. Marine Colonel Matthew Bogdanos, Deputy Director of the Joint Interagency Coordination Group that investigated the loot looting of the Iraqi National Museum on orders of General Tommy Franks. The basement is what we've been calling the inside job. And I will say it forever like a mantra. It is inconceivable to me that the basement was breached and the item stolen without an intimate knowledge of the museum, without a plan, without a conspiracy. From there, about 10,000 pieces were taken, and we've only recovered 650 approximately. That was in an article in Archaeology in January, February 2004. Now, what was in the basement? All the new stuff. Did they get the secrets of the monatomic gold? Slide. We go back again and we, we learn, and I'm sure some of you have heard that Saddam Hussein considered himself the reincarnated Nebuchadnezzar. You didn't know that? And he was building, rebuilding Babylon, right? So maybe that was another reason we had to stop him. He might have been trying to restore the grandeur that was once there in this prehistoric civilization. Well, then that behooves us to take a look at King Nebuchadnezzar, and of course we mostly have to go to the Bible, but we find that King Nebuchadnezzar built what the Bible preachers will tell you is the fiery furnace. But what it was actually, and they give you the dimensions of it, it was a, it was a big portal made of gold. Okay, again, gold figures into all of this. Was he trying to make the white powder of gold? Well, he wasn't having much success, and he would send his people in there, but he, he was getting an energy field going because they'd go in there and they'd die. Does that sound a lot like the Ark of the Covenant, which a lot of people theorize may have been a capacitor to uh, 
manufacture the white powder of gold. 